Hello everyone, I'm Sergey. I'm a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg and I'm going to present to you our joint work with Pedro Moreno Sanchez and Matteo Maffei from Teovin on certain aspects of the privacy and scalability of the Lightning Network. The full paper can be found here. You can read the full paper and this is the version of the presentation that was given at the Lightning Hack Sprint online event on the 9th of May 2020. So let me give you a little bit of a context what Lightning Network is. Lightning Network is a second layer scaling solution for Bitcoin and the general idea is that we uh, leverage the security guarantees of Bitcoin but we perform most of the transactions off the chain therefore we improve latency and we uh, enable payments of uh, smaller value than could be possible in Bitcoin. And a payment channel is uh, a protocol between two parties. It's essentially a two of two multi-signature Bitcoin address that enables two parties to exchange transactions and rebalance the, uh, the, uh, the balance in this channel however they want with off-chain updates. And the key feature of Lightning is of course the revocation mechanism, these uh, game theoretic um, economical security mechanism that enables this uh, quality that if Alice tries to cheat then Bob can now retaliate and take all the funds from the channel and vice versa of course before a certain timeout and therefore we kind of trading this requirement of being online at least once in a while and um, looking at the blockchain and tracking these potential breaches of trust uh, but we're getting um, a large transaction throughput and a very low latency compared to layer layer one which is bitcoin and of course, uh, we don't have to open channels uh, to all the parties in the network. We can leverage multi-hop payments where each user only opens a small number of channels to selected nodes and then payments are being routed through a sequence of channels which are rebalanced atomically. And the atomicity here is important and it's enabled by the fact that all the channel updates are linked by the same secret value. So here is the illustrative uh, payment from user 1 through users 2, 3, 4 and to user 5. And the first step of a typical lightning payment is user 5 generating a random value r locally, calculating the hash of this value, which is h of r, and transferring this value to user number 1 in what is called an invoice message. And then user number 1 offers an htlc, offers a hash time locked contract to user number two, which essentially says, okay, this is a contract between user number one and user number two, and with a secret, um, sorry, with a hash value of y, 1.3 coins will go to user two if user two provides such value that hashes to y. Otherwise, if user number two does not provide such value before time four, then the money will go back or rather the money will be unlocked and the user number one will be able to uh, move this money whatever whatever they please so this is one step of a multi-hop payment the htlc is being created then user number two creates a similar htlc to user number three essentially offering the user number three to give them 1.2 coins because we have this difference as a fee. In this example, 0.1 coins is the fee that user 2 takes, and all the subsequent users take 0.1 coins as well. So user number 2 says, okay, I'm going to give user number 3 1.2 coins if the pre-image of this hash is provided before time 3, and take this money back um, if this is not the case. And then in the first step of the payment, such sequence of HTLCs is created, then user number 5 reveals the secret value r and therefore takes the money from user number 4 then user 4 takes this from user 3 and so on and so on and the payment finalizes this is the typical flow of the payment in the lightning network so here is the outline of the, of, the, of this talk this talk consists of two parts as the uh, as the paper as well consists of two parts which are more or less disjoint the first part evaluates the probabilities of various attacks on the lightning network and the second part evaluates the fact that a certain aspect of Lightning Protocol has on the uh, applicability of micropayments and their feasibility in the real world uh, circumstances. It, it may turn out that the Lightning Network, despite the vision described in the original white paper, is not actually that good 
for very small payments. So starting from part number one, let me first describe the three privacy-related attacks that we considered. I would say first two of them are privacy-related and the third is more of denial-of-service attack. They are value privacy, relationship anonymity and wormhole attack. And I will describe in more detail in the next slides what exactly are those attacks and what is the definition and the criteria for them. But in general, we are trying to answer the question how likely are these attacks and what does their likelihood depend on? Because, of course, for different network parameters and for different uh, capabilities of the attacker, the probability of the attacks is also different. The first attack that we consider is value privacy. This is probably the simplest um, attack. And the goal here for the attacker is to learn the amount that is being transferred. In the Lightning Network, the amounts are not hidden, they are not encrypted. They are transferred in the plain text, so if user number 3 just wants to know how much money is being transferred through, through, through this node, then they can just look it up in the HTLC and see that they received an HTLC of value 1.2 and they were asked to forward HTLC of value 1.1 which means that the true value of the payment is approximately 1. Of course, we cannot say for sure because different nodes may have different uh, fee policies, but assuming that fee is rel relatively small compared to the amount of the payment that has been transferred, then it means that each node along the route can understand with a high precision how much money is being transferred. And it's enough, as you can see, for the attacker to control just one of the intermediary nodes. So here note number three. The second attack, which is a little bit more complex, uh, here the attacker wants to learn who pays whom, and if we formulate this problem in the setting as, uh, as cryptographers always do when they talk about cryptographical problems and cryptographical uh, uh, algorithms, we have two, uh, two things happening simultaneously, and the question is, whether uh, an attacker can distinguish between these two things with a probability better than 50% or significantly better than uh, what just randomly flipping a coin. So here these two events are two payments. The first payment flows from user 1 through users 2, 3, 4 to user 5. And the second payment is flowing from user 1 prime through the same uh, intermediary nodes 2, 3 and 4 to user 5 prime. And the goal of the attacker who controls two nodes along this common part of this route, namely user 4 and user 2, is to distinguish between these HTLCs which one goes to 5 from, from uh, um, or rather um, to determine that it is the user 1 prime who pays to user 5 prime and not to user 5 and the user 1 pays to user 5 and not 5 prime, 5 prime. So actually, it's harder to actually formulate this problem than to solve it, because in the Latin network, as I described earlier, the atomicity of payments is enabled by the fact that they share the same payment hash and the same payment pre-image. This means that for all the channel updates, for all the HTLCs here, we have the same value y. Here we have y, here we have y, and uh, in the second payment, we have value y prime here, and here, and here, and here. Therefore, uh, these two nodes can understand who is actually paying to whom. And the third attack that we consider, uh, here the attacker is trying to cheat a little bit and to uh, take the fees from honest participants. So imagine the attacker controlling user number one and user number four, and the first part of the payment uh, goes as usual. Uh, the sequence of HTLCs is being created from user one to two, three, four, and five. And then user five starts um, redeeming the payment by revealing the secret, secret value R to user four. But then instead of sharing this value with user three and um, redeeming the, the payment from user 3, user 4 just forwards this, this secret value R outside of the Lightning protocol to user number 2, which allows user 2 to redeem the value from user 1. As a result, uh, users 1 and 5 
actually may not even notice anything because from their point of view everything is fine and payment is finalized this is good but the user 3 is being um, cheated here because the fees that were intended for users 2 and 3 were actually um, collected only by user 2 and not only user 3 loses the fees user 3 also has the capital uh, the, the capital locked up because these HTLCs are not redeemed and they will have to expire and only after the timeout user 3 would be able to withdraw the funds or allocate the funds elsewhere or use these funds in the channels to forward other payments and um, and earn fees so this possibility is also taken away from this user while this attack is happening now let's talk about what parameters influence the attack success rate first of all it's important how many nodes are compromised of course if if the whole network is under the adversarial control then it's basically game over and everything is very bad uh, if the attacker has only one node somewhere on the periphery of the network, it's probably not scary at all. So we're trying to quantify uh, what happens in the middle, how many nodes an attacker should compromise to achieve some non-negligible uh, success rate of the attack. Which nodes are compromised? This is also very important because nodes have different, um, have different degree of... Uh, authority so to say in the lightning network of course from the protocol point of view um, everyone can join it's an open network and you don't have to ask for permission just deploy your bitcoins and open channels and you're good but um, because of the economical reasons there are nodes which have larger liquidity and more channels and of course payments are flowing through them more actively than they are flowing through some nodes with fewer channels or with less capital committed and intuitively, it makes more sense to attack these large, large payment hubs. But again, we don't know yet how exactly efficient it is, how much, efficient, how much more efficient it is compared to another approach. So we are quantifying this as well later in the paper. Uh, everything is also uh, dependent on the payment amount because small payments have more options. Because payment can only flow through a channel if the payment is smaller than the capacity of the channel or to be even more precise is smaller than the balance at one side at the sender's side of the channel but in any case small payments have more options because more channels can accommodate small payments rather than large payments so it may be the case that the attacker occupies some large nodes in the middle of the network but small payments can still flow around flow through smaller channels but large payments cannot we quantify that as well. And how long the routes can be is also important because for longer routes uh, it is more likely to uh, stumble upon a compromised node. But for our experiments we limit the path lengths to four channels, which means three intermediary nodes. Uh, we show also this graph is in the paper that for mo most uh, common payment amounts for smaller and medium sized payments this is basically enough to uh, enough that at least some paths exist for a given payment from, from a random sender to a random receiver. This means that in the real life, as the real Lightning implementations also optimize, among other things, for um, for shorter routes, we think that that our results are applicable in the real world as well. This is our uh, our approach from a more practical standpoint. We didn't mess with real lightning nodes or channels. We conducted our experiments in a simulated environment using a public uh, lightning network snapshot. First of all, we created a graph model from a lightning network snapshot. And here I should say a huge thank you to Fiatjaf, Fiatjaf for this website. This website contains the historical information about all public lightning network channels and the timestamps when they have been opened, when they have been closed, their amounts and so on. This proved hugely valuable for our resource. Basically we're based we we, we have uh, based our research on these data set. Thanks a lot. Uh, so for a given combination of parameters we create 100 random pairs. Uh, this would be a sender and a receiver. And for each pair we generate all paths 
that are at least theoretically suitable for this payment amount. So only uh, contain channels uh, with the capacity larger or equal to the payment amount. And for each such path, we check whether it's prone to one of our attacks or not. Each of the three attacks, uh, we, de we define it uh, as a kind of a template, a kind of a pattern on a path, and we check each path against this pattern. For example, for the value privacy, the pattern is very simple, just one compromised node anywhere in the path. For the relationship anonymity, the attacker has to compromise two distinct nodes along the path, and for the wormhole attack, the pattern is a bit more complex. Then the attacker has to compromise two nodes along the path, but there also must be an honest node in the middle, because this is the node that is the victim in this attack. And then we calculate the share of paths which are prone to an attack, as opposed to the ones that are not, and by averaging across all random sender-receiver pairs, we estimate the probability of a successful attack given a certain parameter combinations. So this is our uh, parameter. This, these are our parameters and, and the values that we consider. Uh, which nodes are being compromised? Uh, we consider two, uh, two metrics, two heuristics for, um, for important nodes, or for important hubs, so to say. We consider the nodes with the highest number of channels adjacent to them, and we consider nodes with highest total capacity in the channels. Of course, the subsets intersect to a large extent because uh, channel because nodes which open lots of channels also tend to be um, well capitalized. But these are still distinct subsets of Lightning Network, and as a control group, we, we use random selection of nodes. Another parameter, another uh, axis, is how many nodes are being compromised. We consider these values from zero to one hundred. And for the reference, at the time of our experiments in February 2020, Latin Network contained uh, this many nodes and these many channels, nearly 6,000 6, nodes and more than 35,000 channels, only talking, of course, about the public part of the network. And payment amount is also uh, important for our experiments. We considered four payment amounts, uh, the powers of 10 from 100 to 100,000 satoshis, which, assuming this exchange rate of $10,000 per Bitcoin, um, corresponds to 10 US cents, $1, $10, and $100. So this uh, slide represents our main results, and let me spend some time explaining this, because it may be not obvious uh, from the first glance. So we have these nine subgraphs, and each subgraph contains the x-axis, which represents the payment amount in satoshis from 100 to 1000, 10,000 and 100,000. And the y-axis shows the share of paths between a random sender-receiver pair that are vulnerable to an attack from 0% to 100%. The three columns correspond to the three attacks, so we have the value privacy, three graphs, relationship anonymity attack, and the wormhole attack. And finally, the three rows correspond to the type of nodes that we consider compromised. The top row is the highest degree nodes compromised, uh, the middle row is highest capacity nodes, and here we have the random nodes compromised. And on each of the subgraphs, the lines represent the number of... Uh, each line represent the share of vulnerable paths for this number of nodes compromised, from 0 to 5 to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100. So if we take some graph, for example, let me take this graph and explain how, how you should read it. Um, if we compromise 0 nodes, then for the payment of 100 Satoshi, we have 0% vulnerable paths, for 1,000 Satoshi, we have 0% vulnerable paths. For, uh, sorry, for 100, for 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, still zero vulnerable paths, which is absolutely um, logical because we have zero nodes compromised. 
Then if we have five malicious nodes, so which ones with the highest capacity, right? If we compromise five highest capacity nodes, then let's see how many paths are vulnerable to value privacy attack. So we have about 30%, about 25%, about 20 something percent, and about 30 or maybe 35% for different amounts. Then if we compromise more nodes, 10 highest capacity nodes, we have about 40% paths that are vulnerable, and so on. So this is how you should read these graphs. And then if we go to the big picture, first of all, our control experiment on the random group shows that, of course, it doesn't make any sense for the attacker to attack random nodes, because it just doesn't help at all. Only if the attacker compromises 100 uh, random nodes, then the probability of success of the attack on value privacy raises a little bit above zero, but for all other cases, basically everything else is zero. So random compromise doesn't work. But if the attacker compromises the nodes with the highest capacity, then we see a common pattern which replicates in other graphs as well. The more nodes the attacker compromises, the higher is the share of vulnerable paths. This is also logical. And in this particular case, it's enough to compromise 20 highest capacity nodes to have the probability of success of the attack at more than 50% already. And if 100 nodes are compromised, then we have nearly 100% um, probability of successful attack. How does this compare to other combinations of parameters? If we compare across this row, so how do different attacks behave for the highest capacity nodes being compromised, we see that the effect is the same, but it's smaller, it's weaker. And if we go from 0 to 5 to 10 to 20 and so on compromised nodes, the share of vulnerable paths raises only a little bit. And wormhole attack also this is probably just a statistical artifact, but otherwise um, it's harder to perform a wormhole attack given a fixed number of nodes compromised than it is to perform relationship anonymity attack or value privacy attack. And we explain it by the fact that just the structure of the path is simpler in this case. So for the attacker it's easier to compromise just one node anywhere in the path, as it is the case here, rather than to compromise two nodes in the path, as is the case here or uh, even harder, um, it is to compromise two nodes with an additional constraint than one honest node must be in the middle between uh, the two compromised nodes. Finally, if we compare these graphs across columns, this one with this one, the question is, what is, it, uh, what is better for the attacker? Is it to focus on the highest capacity nodes or on highest degree nodes? And as um, we show is now in our graphs, it is prefer pre preferable to focus on the highest degree nodes because, as you see, the probability of the attack raises more quickly than with the highest capacity nodes. Just by compromising five highest degree nodes, the attacker gains around 50% chance of successful attack compared to around 25-30% in this case. And this pattern also represents itself in these graphs and in these graphs as well. So from that we conclude that for the attacker, uh, the most, at least from these strategies, the most uh, profitable and the most preferable strategy is to focus on the highest degree nodes. Maybe that's explainable by the fact that the most, uh, the largest number of payments in the Lightning Network are relatively small, and for small payments. It doesn't matter that much if the channels are um, very large. It matters most whether uh, intermediary nodes are well connected. And regular payments, which are not very large in terms of satoshis, they will flow through intermediary nodes with the highest connectivity rather than the highest total capacity. So the takeaway from part one is that it's enough to compromise 
relatively few nodes, so um, 100 nodes, even 100 nodes is around 2% of the size of the whole network. And the attacker should probably focus on highest degree nodes rather than highest capacity nodes. Of course, compromising random nodes is more or less useless, as we have shown with the data. And a fun fact is that this entity known as Ellen Big at some point controlled about 40% of Lightning Network capacity, which means that the scenario where many import no important nodes are under the control of one centralized entity is not that far-fetched. It's actually rather close to reality, and uh, it's important to understand that and the um, what it means for privacy and security of the Lightning Network. There is an efficiency privacy trade-off, as it often happens, you have to pay for privacy. If you want to protect your payments, probably you shouldn't optimize too much for fees, and uh, you should understand that going through large popular uh, intermediary nodes um, makes you more vulnerable, because these nodes are more likely to be the target of an attack and potential compromise that would enable tracking users' payments and something like that. Now going to uh, part two of the paper, we study the issue of concurrent HTLCs. So the question that we studied here is how does Lightning Network handle concurrent payments? There is this uh, little known fact in the Lightning specification and indeed the implementations as well, that the number of in-flight HTLCs of concurrent payments, in other words, that a Lightning Channel can handle is limited because Bitcoin transaction size is limited and um, we have to be able to close the channel in one transaction, basically. And therefore, a channel can keep only up to 966 unsettled HTLCs. We call this uh, HTLC slots and we argue that for small payments, these HTLC slots get depleted faster than the capacity gets depleted. So, for the first of all, for transactions under the dust limit, which is 546 satoshis, no HTLCs is even created. So, this problem that we discuss in this uh, in this part of our paper does not apply to these ultra small payments, but they are not protected by the Bitcoin security guarantees anyway. But then we have the small payments which are above the dust limit where the HTLC is created, but uh, it may be the case that the HTLC slots will get depleted faster than the capacity will get depleted, which means that the channel will be underutilized. So the channel can be in the state where a channel has more capacity and the, can the channel could theoretically handle even more payments, but it cannot do this because it has 966 unsettled HTLCs hanging around and waiting for the pre-image to be revealed or for the timeout to expire. We tried to measure this effect and measure the evolution of this effect over time. Our uh, most important metric that we define in the paper is the effective update rate of the channel. And here is the illustrative example to better understand what this means. If you consider a channel with a capacity 10 thousand satoshis, then it means that theoretically it could handle 1,000 in-flight transactions of value 10. But in fact, due to the specification and implementations, uh, it won't be allowed to handle more than 966 transactions, which means that it will be uh, under underutilized, that some capacity will go underutilized. Now, this is how this percentage changes depending on the transaction amount. So. If the transaction amount is just above the dust limit, so the HTLC is actually created, we calculate that around 20% is the actual effective update rate. So the channels will be only 20% utilized. And this utilization ratio, uh, this uh, number of concurrent updates that the channel can actually handle as opposed to the amount that it could theoretically handle, raises linearly until it reaches this inflection point, which we call the borderline amount of around 2,700. Above this limit, the capacity is the, the limiting factor, and this HTLC limit issue doesn't play a role here, because 
uh, the capacity is actually what limits the throughput of the channel. But in this interval from a bit more than 500 satoshis to a bit under 3000 satoshis, this is the interval for micropayments that we want to, uh, to investigate a little bit more. We also calculate the share of affected channels and we see that for again for an average transaction amount which is very close to dust limit nearly 50 percent of the channels are affected this means that half of the lightning network channels are less effective than they could have been if not for this limit and this uh, this uh, percentage of affected channels drops until it reaches uh, around 10 percent so for average transaction amount of around 10,000 satoshis, still around 10% of channels can be underutilized due to this issue. We also generated a number of snapshots uh, on the 1st of every month from the 1st of March 2018, just after the uh, launch of the Lightning Network on Mainnet, and we calculated how this share of affected channels uh, has changed over time. And we observe that it has been raising for different transaction amounts. This blue line is the dust limit. And here we have 1k, 10k, and 100k satoshis. It, uh, all these lines have been raising pretty steadily until around mid-2019. And from then, for, for about a year now, they have been steady. So it means that these, this effect that we have just described uh, is not getting worse, it's not getting better, but it affects Latin network more or less in the same range as it used to during the past year. And finally, uh, we were interested in how the borderline transaction amount has changed. It has risen dramatically in late 2018, then it uh, has stayed relatively stable, and for the past months, it is somewhere around 2,500 satoshis. So for the values of payments below 2,500 satoshis, this issue is actually relevant. This is the takeaway, and the takeaway is that the Latin network may be not that well suited for micropayments as the original Lightning uh, paper envisioned. The Latin paper of 2016 by Poonan Raja contained uh, paragraphs that described use cases such, such as uh, that users would be able to pay for each megabyte of internet traffic that they consume or uh, for every second of video that they watch. But actually, these use cases for very small and very frequent payments may not, may not be possible, at least at the current level of technology. Below the dust limit for payments below this number of satoshis, uh, the payments are not even secured by HTLCs at all, so they don't inherit the uh, the security from the layer 1 Bitcoin as larger Lightning payments do. But in this range, from 546 to 25,000 Satoshis, these payments are less efficient than it could be possible in theory, and the closer we are to this, uh, to the left, to the smaller side of this range, the more profound this effect is. And we observe that this effect is stable in the current Lightning Network until around mid-2019. Uh, by the way, HTLC limit is also a basis for a nasty denial-of-service attack, which we discuss briefly in our paper, and we do some um, back-of-the-envelope calculations on how, um, how much value should the attacker commit to this attack. It turns out that uh, there have been described attacks in the literature where an attacker can block the capacity along a route when the attacker uh, initiates a payment and initiates a series of HTLCs being offered but then does not redeem it from the receiver's end, which means that the capacity in all the channels is locked for the duration of the timeout, which can be pretty long. But here, with this HTLC limit, we can do basically the same thing, but with lower capital requirements and the attacker would be able to block the capacity in the channels just by sending a thousand micropayments but not finalizing them which requires uh, a very uh, small amount of money compared to other 
possible ways to achieve the same effect. Let me suggest a couple of papers, uh, three papers that we cite in the paper and which seem relevant to what I've just described. Malavolta and co-authors described anonymous multi-hop locks for blockchain scalability and interoperability, and this work suggests a cryptographic mechanism that would let the Lightning Network move away from this um, architecture where each payment, each channel update along a route is linked with other updates in the same transaction by the same payment hash, which lets intermediary nodes to understand, uh, basically to link the parts of the same payment, which is bad for relationship anonymity. So this uh, this is a proposal how to fix this. This is a paper that uh, appeared concurrently to our research and they uh, went uh, into more detail uh, regarding the denial of service vector that I described on the previous slide. So how the congestion attacks in payment channel networks can work and how an attacker with relatively small uh, requirements, capital requirements, can block large chunks of the Lightning Network. Finally, this work, uh, Lockdown, Balance Availability Attack Against Lightning Network Channels, um, also proposes a denial of service vector for uh, Lightning Network attack, uh, which you can read and compare to our approach. Um, Lightning Network is an exciting field of study for privacy and security researchers, I would say, with this new, uh, new privacy model and new um, yeah, new security model, new security assumptions compared to Bitcoin um, makes it a very exciting field of study and I anticipate lots of interesting papers to come and let's hope that they are not only, <laughs> not only lead to publications in prestigious conferences and journals but also lead to the improvements in the actual Lightning protocol and implementations so that we can all benefit from uh, fast, reliable, secure and private uh, Bitcoin payments over layer 1 and layer 2 and possibly future layer 3 or what have you. Uh, let me give you a link to the paper one more time. Huge thanks to Pedro and Matteo. Huge thanks for Theo Wien for hosting me in the summer of 2019 for research visit. And you can follow me on Twitter at this Twitter handle. Thank you.